Good morning, and on behalf of Thurrock Council, welcome to this online event in honour of International Women's Day 2022. My name is Martine Croxall, I'm a presenter with the BBC uh, News Channel and also a founder member, very proudly, of BBC Women, a group that campaigns for equal pay at the BBC with some success. Um, I'd like to make a mention of students and lecturers who hopefully are watching us from South Essex College, a particular welcome to you today. The theme of International Women's Day this year is Breaking the Bias, where we're invited to imagine a gender equal world, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that's diverse, equitable and inclusive, a world where difference is valued and celebrated. Together, we can forge women's equality. I just want to take a moment, if I may, to remember the women of Ukraine who are trying desperately to hold on to fragments of normality in what is an extraordinary set of uh, developments that we're seeing since Russia invaded and basically declared war on them. More needs to be done to ensure the gender imbalance is addressed so that our, uh, we have a truly diverse and inclusive workforce for future generations. Our focus will be on the challenges women still face and how things are changing for the better. We'll ask what needs to be done to address the sex imbalance so the workforce is truly diverse and inclusive. Our contributors will share some of their biggest career learnings and we are joined by a panel of leading women in business. And I acknowledge we are notable for our blondness, which we will address because I recognise that is also very, very, very noticeable this morning. Lynn Carpenter is Chief Executive of Thurrock Council. She took up her post in September 2015, joining Thurrock from Hammersmith and Fulham and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which were by boroughs, where she was Executive Director of Environment, Leisure and Residence Services. Lynn also chaired the Tri-Borough, including Westminster City Council, Public Health Board, Violence Against Women and Girls Board. Outside work, Lynn has been involved for over 40 years with netball as a player, a coach, administrator and volunteer. She's chairman of Netball Europe and was an England under 18 and under 21 player, becoming a senior international in 1997, representing England in the Commonwealth Games the following year and the year after that at the Netball World Championships, winning bronze medals in both. Welcome. The Right Honourable Ruth Kelly is chair of Thames Freeport as former secretary of state, Ruth has a deep knowledge of government and the logistics sector, which will help drive forward the Freeport's transformational programmes to increase knowledge transfer, skills development and clean growth. She was MP for Bolton West from 1997 till she stood down in 2010, serving as Secretary of State for Transport, Communities and Local Government, Education and Skills, Minister for Women and Equalities, as well as holding ministerial roles in the in the HM Treasury. Since leaving Parliament, Ruth has held roles at HSBC Global Asset Management and St Mary's University, where she was Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise. I think I interviewed you several times in several roles, Ruth. Uh, Lucy Whitaker is founding director of Alpha Vesta. Lucy spent uh, many years working as a frontline domestic abuse practitioner, specialising in complex casework and child protection, and subsequently headed back to university to study study criminology and psychological studies. Alpha Vesta is a community interest company with a mission statement of breaking the cycle of domestic abuse through awareness, prevention and effective and safe early intervention in the workplace. Professor Maria Fasley is Executive Dean Science and Health at the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering at the University of Essex. Maria is a Higher Education Academy National Teaching Fellow and currently the Director of the Institute for Analytics and Data Science at the University of Essex. This is the bit where I get a bit lost because I'm not quite sure what this means, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, she's written various academic titles and journal articles and her current research projects include wait for it, agents and multi-agent systems and their theoretical foundations and practical applications, the analysis and modelling of complex and big data that can be structured or unstructured and user profiling. Hopefully she'll shed some light on some of that in a while. And Samantha Waite is Director of Business Development and External Affairs at Swan Housing Association. Sam's brief includes new business for regeneration and development, as well as strategic communications across all business areas. She gained commercial property and corporate experience during years of practice as a real estate solicitor in the city. Communications and housing expertise gained at the Guinness Partnership and at Swan enables Sam to promote the Swan Group, explore new opportunities and develop partnerships, 
while ensuring that SWAN considers the wider interests of all their stakeholders through engagement and co-design. We are well supplied with brains this morning. Uh, in a moment, I will invite each panellist uh, in turn to make some introductory, introductory remarks for a strict maximum of three minutes, please. Uh, and then we'll have a chance for a group discussion and I uh, hope that uh, that will be more of a conversation between all of you. It's not an interview by me. Don't feel that you can't leap in or stick up your hand. At the end, there'll be 20 minutes or so for uh, questions from the audience. You can submit those at any time during the message function. Just to say that um, Professor Fasley needs to leave us after an hour. We may not get to her for the Q&A, but we'll make sure she has plenty of opportunity to speak. Anyway, welcome to you all. Thank you for taking part. And let me kick off with a few words from Lynn. Martine, thank you. And, and thank you for the invite to be here today. I think uh, what we do collectively and individually really matters. And having a voice and making sure we use that voice in everything we do is really important to me. I've been a chief executive, as you've said, now in local government for 30 years. Um, and there is still a lot that needs to happen to make um, the world we occupy in public sector more equal. It's not there yet, but I think there's a role that we who are in it can play and very much want to uh, model that and work hard to do that. I think it's it's great to have the event today um, and really to celebrate all that women achieve, but also what more can be done and in particular what success looks like individually and collectively. And I think for me that question about what success looks like is something we sometimes lose sight on and I'd be uh, interested to ex explore that a little bit more. So uh, really pleased to be here and happy to uh, contribute and answer any questions as we go along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. That was nice and nice and brief. Thank you. Um, everyone else doesn't have to be quite that succinct if they'd like to take a bit more time. Ruth. Sure. I was going to say I suffer a little bit still from imposter syndrome, like I, I never ought to be doing what, I, what I'm doing at the moment, which might seem a bit um, surprising to others. But I came over to um, England uh, from Northern Ireland um, as a toddler. So my parents are Northern Irish Catholics, and I guess it sort of goes with the territory, never quite feeling that, that you belong and that you're you know, destined to do well. Um, and um, I, I also grew up with a very strong sense of wanting to do something good for society. So I went to study um, medicine at, at university at, at Oxford. Um, I knew on day one that wasn't going to be for me. I didn't like the sight of blood and um, I couldn't bear the anatomy. So, uh, so that, really, um, that really wasn't going to work. Um, so I switched at that point to politics, philosophy and economics. And it's only when I started to study sort of politics and policy and political philosophy that I got really interested like most young people, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do after university. I wasn't involved in politics whatsoever. And um, I um, managed to worm work my way in as a researcher onto the Guardian newspaper as an economics writer um, uh, when I came out of university and stayed there for five years. I um, was um, then asked by uh, the then head of economics, Mervyn King, to go to the Bank of England for a couple of years to to help work on monetary policy and write, help write the inflation report. But throughout all that time, I was thinking, you know, how can I actually do something that, that's really going to make a difference? And that's when I decided to run um, for Parliament. Um, and I was lucky enough to be selected in, in Bolton West for a marginal seat. It had been held by a Conservative minister at that time, and we had a massive swing in 97. There was just a massive swing to Labour. So I was, I was the beneficiary of that. I spent 13 years in politics, as you've outlined at the beginning, in various roles. Um, always slightly surprised when I was um, uh, moved up to the next rank. And um, sometimes I wonder what that said about other people more than it, what it said about me. But um, um, enjoyed that time very much. But it was it was very, very strange. When I started in Parliament, there was a massive influx in, of women. Before that time, there had been more men in the Cabinet called John. Than the, uh, or men in Parliament called John than there had been, than there had been women. Um, so, so that really represented a, a massive sea change in, in politics, uh, which was much to its benefit, I think. Um, but after 13 years on the, on the front line, I decided it was time to go off and do different things. So I spent some time in finance because I had a sort of economics background. 
uh, and then went into higher education at St Mary's University and have now got a portfolio of, of roles of which working with Thurrock Council with the Thames at Freeport is, uh, is the major backbone of my uh, portfolio. So very much enjoying that and hope to see the local economy really reinvigorated, uh, regenerated and made as inclusive as, as we possibly can. Yes, it'd be fascinating to see how that helps women in particular in that part of uh, the country. Thank you very much, Ruth. Lucy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Lucy Whittaker, and I'm the founding director and lead trainer of Alpha Vesta. Uh, and as Maxine said in her lovely introduction, uh, we are dedicated to breaking the cycle of domestic abuse across communities. Uh, we place employment and the workplace very, very much uh, at the heart of that. Just to give some perspective of kind of why, why I do what I do, really, uh, domestic abuse accounts for 22% of police recorded crime across Essex. Uh, this has an enormous impact. It has an enormous impact on employment, career progression, absence, lateness, mental health and well-being. And that impact really sadly ripples across a whole workforce and a whole community in really complex ways. As Maxine said, um, I myself was a frontline uh, practitioner specialising in complex casework and child protection. So I've seen lives destroyed uh, by domestic abuse and was determined to find better ways of reaching people at a much, much earlier point, either preventing domestic abuse in the first place or creating opportunities perhaps to intervene at a much earlier point. Now, when we think about uh, today's theme of breaking the bias, uh, which is the theme of this year's International uh, Women's Day, I want people to think about the biases that there may be in terms of domestic abuse. Uh, people often have a stereotype of what a domestic abuse victim might look like, uh, for instance. In fact, over 60% of those experienced domestic abuse are in employment. Two thirds of them say that they feel safer at work compared to at home. So this is a massive opportunity to not only understand the importance of employment and the workplace uh, in terms of perhaps spotting those signs, recognising those signs, but potentially this could be a really powerful point in someone's journey to offer that supportive hand and intervene perhaps uh, in that journey. Think about all those that don't fall within our stereotype, though, because domestic abuse, remember, as I say, can affect everybody, whether they're a director, a manager, a construction worker, a teacher, an accountant. So what I really sort of want to bring to today's uh, sort of session, really, and, and really in line with that theme, is to be really thinking about those biases and stereotypes that we perhaps already have uh, in our heads without even thinking about it. Um, but thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. Maria. Thank you very much for inviting me. What, what an honour it is to be contributing to, um, to this event. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was brought up um, in a very traditional family in Greece where women would be homemakers looking after children or when working to support their family, they would be mostly in low paid jobs and both my parents were low paid workers. But my father was instrumental in making me believe in myself and pushing me to achieve, but also to go into whatever profession I wanted to, even if this was perceived to be very male oriented. Fortunately or unfortunately, I was interested in science, mathematics and computers from a very young age, which I guess must have looked really weird to my family. At least this is what my grandfather um, used to tell me. Uh, but my father kept encouraging me to go, for, uh, to go for it, essentially, and just be the best that I could. I had no female role model, which I think would really have helped me. Um, at the time. But when I entered university in Greece, there were other women there. But as I decided to progress to a PhD and then moved into academia as a career, I have been observing the number of women decreasing um, in the sciences in general, but more specifically in computer science and electronic engineering. 
in progressing in academia in itself, um, in what can be considered to be very male-dominated disciplines, has not been easy, and significant periods of, of, of time in, um, in, in my career. I happen to be the only female member of staff in academic departments with over 50 males. Um, sometimes I was the youngest or the second youngest. Uh, at some point, I became the head of school of such an academic department with over uh, 50 males, um, which had never had uh, a line manager who was female. So um, I, I had some interesting um, experiences. But what I feel passionate about is women in whatever profession they decide to do. We need more women in science, we need more women in tech, and for me, stereotypes that suggest that women are not good at it, we are not um, able to make decisions fast enough, we just cannot think uh, in, a, in the kind of way that is required to achieve what we want in business or any other um, facet of life. We just need to bring to bring it down. We need to break down the barriers and break glass ceilings. So thank you very much for the invitation to contribute. Thank you very much. It's great to have pioneering women with us. Um, I'm going to ask Sam to speak next, but Sam, could you first switch off your camera and back on again? Because we're struggling to get it to record at the moment. So if you can switch, uh, take your camera off and then back on again, that would be really helpful. And hopefully that will work. But we should be able to hear you anyway. That's perfect. Thank you. That's working. Great. Great. OK, over to you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. I mean, gosh, imposter syndrome. If Ruth is feeling this, you can't imagine what I am feeling. But as a local girl, I grew up in Thurrock. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And preparing for today made me think about my career in a really different way. And I was thinking about role models, how perhaps today, you know, one of the things we could reflect on is how important it is for us to see women and see the what we could possibly achieve and from my own experience I remember like Ruth I made a mistake I, I chose the wrong thing at university and I had to have a gap year while I waited to go and study law and I ended up getting a job at JP Morgan and this was an absolute revelation to me I, I, I was so fortunate to have got it but I, I not only did I get that commercial experience that got me a foot in the door against kids frankly who had much better connections than me to get a job in a city law firm later but I saw these women who were not only working hard and were inspirational I had women like that in my life but I saw women who were like earning money which made them financially independent and were really owning being in charge and I think that for me was just life-changing and then there have been times when I've had to be the role model so when I had my daughter as when I was working as a city lawyer in 2005 flexible working wasn't an option and instead it was me having to you know little me having to be the woman who persuaded a city law firm that actually women could do both and giving us an element of flexibility wouldn't mean we would let our clients down so that was a massive pressure but I did do it and you know lots of my female colleagues would say to me after you know thanks to you we we kind of got flexibility which of course came later, you know, now, now, now much more people are offered that. But I just think um, now I'm in a position where I don't feel like I've achieved all I could, but actually working in social housing as, as a sector that's very progressive, you know, we take really seriously our responsibilities to not only, you know, influence our colleagues, and I founded with, with a colleague our Inspiring Swans Network, which hopefully I'll talk about later, but also with the communities that we're working in. You know, to be a woman who goes on a Zoom call during lockdown and talks about what Perfectly on Thames might bring is great because it means that women will listen and think, oh, actually, you know, if she's saying, and it's just so important and not to be underestimated. So absolutely delighted to be here, and um, I'll try and do my best to... to to give my views, but I'm not suggesting I can compete with you girls. I think we we set all of that to one side. Nobody's an imposter here and no <laughs> one is to apologise. Women do far too much of that. Um, let me just throw this out there then, because you've all touched on the fact that it's important to have like a a, vi a vision of where you might want to go and how you might get there. And Maria has said that she didn't have women around her when she was setting out. So I was talking the other day in the newsroom to some uh, of my very young producer colleagues who were black and Asian. And they were saying for them, it's and look at us, hey, um, it's really important for them to be able to, if you can see it, you can be it, is what they said. So talk to me as a group about how important it is um, to have those role models and what what are you doing to try to nurture and encourage young women 
um, not just white women, but women from all backgrounds, all social classes, uh, all, all religions. Um, Ruth. Well, I, I totally agree with you, but I just want to say something that when I got to work on The Guardian, I'd never knowingly met a journalist in my life before going to The Guardian. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's that if you don't know people like that, you can't make those steps. I uh, took a big risk, sort of psychologically, took a big risk to go and, you know, write and ring up and sort of get through the door. Uh, obviously, it would have been great to know people who'd done that before. Um, but, but different, you know, different people have, have different experiences there. I... Uh... I agree. I mean, I went into a newsroom and found it terrifying the first day, but also thrilling. Yeah. Um, it was chaos. And I, now I love that chaos. And now yeah. I'm part of that uh, chaos. Um, but, and of course, everybody does know what they're doing because they're highly professional. But when you first go in, I think you have to have that sort of, you have to make a leap and sort of take a deep breath, don't you? I mean, Maria's nodding vigorously there. I mean, how did you get over that that fear that must have been there, Maria, that you were the odd one out. And what, what do you do to try and nurture new talent? Um, talent? Thank you. This is a really interesting question and one that I have been thinking about uh, actually on a regular basis, because looking back at some of the things that I've done and the kind of environments that I put myself in, um, taking the leadership of an all-male academic department, um, and driving things through. I think um, my father played a very important role in instilling in my head that I'm not different to men and I can do things that men can do, but actually I can do some of them even better and I just need to believe in myself. I know this may sound weird, but if someone drills something in your head for 20 years, it's very difficult for someone else to come around and say, well, you're not worth it or you cannot do it. Uh, so for me, it was I was just trying to do my job. But I think it would have helped m uh, me to have a role model. And at, uh, at some point then I started having role models that I could aspire to and I could look up to and I, can, uh, I could seek help. And I think it's very important that all of us play this role. And I'm in academia, so what I can do is I can... Um, a, uh, help uh, colleagues within the university, female colleagues, but also other genders um, and also the um, other communities that are underrepresented, um, like BAME communities, to aspire um, and not be drawn down to stereotypes about things that they can and they cannot do. But for me, one key role that I've got as being um, someone who works in education in to inspire, is to inspire, if you like, the younger generation, because we need to start making an impact from a very um, early age. Women need to understand that they can achieve when they are in, in, in school, not when they get to do their GCSEs or A-levels. We need to start early. So I see a key role uh, for all of us, actually, to play um, there. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn, are you, just may, may I say, Maria, my dad sounded like your dad. Um, those same messages, he's, I have a sister, um, those same messages were coming across loud and clear. And, and actually, I go into schools and do a lot of talks about journalism and about the news. And it's it, it, it's always thrilling to me when the girls' hands go up, because that seems to be getting better over time. And it's usually young women who come and ask me for um, work experience more than more than the men. So maybe sort of seeing a, a woman in that job it gives them a bit of a push. Lynn. Thanks, Martin. And it's interesting listening to colleagues because there are, there are a huge amount of similarities between all of us. So I didn't mention at the beginning, I did physics, chemistry and biology A-level. I was the only uh, female in my A-level physics class. And my parents were, were very much as Maria has described. I, I describe them as pioneers. They went off and travelled the world in the 1950s when it was in, you know, just didn't happen. And they always encouraged my brother and I to... Um, to do what we were comfortable and happy doing. And I put it in that context because it was about finding um, your own spark and what really drove you. And they created in, in us a curiosity about the world and how we do things and about our own ability. And, you know, when I did um, my O-levels, which I was probably my age as well, um, I chose to do woodwork and metalwork 
at school because my dad said, well, it's practical, isn't it? You'd be able to do all sorts of things. And I can hang wallpaper. I can, you know, make um, all sorts of things in the house practically. And, and, I, and I think the commonality here is, is having people around you who give you that confidence to do the things that make you happy and that you're good at. And actually, there is there is something in there about it's not about necessarily being male or female. It's about finding your space. And the point I made at the beginning, I'm doing a lot of thinking about well, what does success look like to us as achieving women? And sometimes it's not just always chasing what we think the traditional outline of success looks like as well. So there's there's something in there um, for me. But I think in terms of that, you know, I was reflecting on my career. I've been in local government 30 years. And even now, I sit in many meetings where I'm the only female. And I need to reflect on that because it's it's something I've got used to and I don't notice it as much as I used to do. But it is still very common that that, that happens. But I would ask ourselves, because there are some brilliant women out there, and in my, in my organisation, 75% of my senior team are female. And I ask the team, and I'll be asking them when we do a session at lunchtime, what is stopping us from applying for those jobs? What is actually really stopping us? And how do we support each other in doing it? And Maria was saying about um, childcare. Well, yeah, absolutely, I've got a 13-year-old son. Really difficult stuff, but you find ways in doing it. So how do we share some of our, our shared experience? And the point about agile working that Sam made, I thought was really pertinent to the world we're in now post COVID as well, because I think we need to be thinking about those of us in influential positions. Work is what we do, not where we do it as well. And it's setting some of the parameters in, in, in that way. So um, yeah, really, really interesting, strong thinking. Sam? Sam? Thanks. I think it's about really practical things that we need to do, Martine. Your question was, you know, how are we uh, helping people of colour at SWAN or how are we helping um, LGBTQI people? Actually, the truth is we're putting in really practical programmes. So we have groups, we have SWAN Nation, we have our SWAN Proud group and we have our Inspiring SWAN group. One of the biggest changes we've seen this year is we're bringing all those groups together and where we've had mentoring targeted at the different groups, to, to, as Lynn said, let them see... Let, let them meet people who will give them confidence to to achieve people like them or, or frankly just people who are achieving but instead of just doing that in each group we're now bringing it together as a as swan together and making sure that we're offering training which kind of helps people grow themselves but also builds allies so that you can feel confident in a meeting that there will be someone who will support you and I think that is making a really big difference and we've seen big changes in the number of women in our teams but also the diversity of our senior team has changed significantly there's still a long way to go on both counts but we're definitely starting to see practical change. Lucy thank you Sam. Lucy. Yeah, I just wanted to say I feel one of the, the most important things that we can bring um, to people um, is, is about hope. And actually by looking at, at perhaps what we've achieved and, and talking about some of the things we've achieved, it gives others hope. And I also think it's not necessarily about talking about all the great things we've done. We actually want to share some of the challenges we've experienced as well. And sometimes in the arena that I work in, sort of around crime and I work with the police and people look at, at me and think, you know, you haven't had any hardship. I mean, you're not, you're not black, you're not Asian, you don't live on a particular estate, all of those stereotypes that we have. And then I say to them, honestly, I say, I'm a five foot blonde from Essex. I've experienced more discrimination <laughs> <laughs> than you've probably experienced in my little finger on a Monday morning. So sometimes it is about breaking down some of these barriers, isn't it? Talking about some of our challenges and creating that rapport and connection, you know, and, and sometimes I'll say to somebody, no, I, you know, I've experienced this, but perhaps you tell me some of the challenges you're experiencing, because ultimately I feel that just gives people hope. Thank you. I mean, so much to uh, focus on there. I mean, the issue of, you know, what does success look like? Sometimes it's about getting that balance in your life right. It might not be, you know, being at the very top of your game all the time, but you're trying to balance it with having a family life that's sort of in some sort of equilibrium as well. Uh, the importance of allies, maybe we can talk about that in a second as well. And also, what are the challenges that we have each individually face and how have we overcome them? Let's look about the allies um, Sorry, Ruth, you, you, you pick up. 
Yes, I just wanted to pick up on that on that point, actually, um, Martin, that, that Lynn raised about what success looked like, because I think about this quite a lot. And um, numerous people um, come and ask me for a cup of coffee and say, should I go into politics or, or you know, what should my next step be and, and so forth? And I am really, really honest uh, in my conversations with them. And I say, just go in, if you're going to do it, with your eyes wide open and think about some of the challenges you're going to face, as well as some of the career stimulation, as it were. And you can add value in all sorts of ways in society. And what success looks like for each individual person could be very, very different. I mean, I would have gone nuts if I'd stayed at home and looked after the four children that I had during during my uh, during my career. I probably would have gone completely completely nuts. Um, however, I would have been extraordinarily unhappy if I'd not been able to be a very active part of the, of their lives and have, would have felt very very unfulfilled. And going into politics. You've got to try and make it work for you. And some people will, will be able to make that work and some people won't be able to make that work. Uh, so there are all sorts of challenges to think about. So how I think did you make, to, how did you make it work then? Ruth? Well, I made it work because um, and I was, you know, I went through this whole thing of feeling I was never in the right place at the right time. Um, I was expected to be in Parliament. I was expected to be in my constituency, which is north of Manchester. And I was expected to be at home uh, with the family as well. I was never in any of those places uh, for as long as they as they wanted me and needed me. Um, so um, I was extremely fortunate for two reasons. One, when I was elected to Parliament, we had a massive majority. Now, that meant when there were controversial bills being voted on, if um, if I needed not to be there for some reason, that wouldn't, as it were, mean the opposition won. You know, the government could live with, with me not being there. Uh, so, so the relationship with the whips and how that worked was was extremely important. Se second decision was to base my family in London so that I could see them every day. Uh, third decision was that my husband, who was then a local councillor, decided to um, give up um, being involved in in politics himself and uh, and take on a job which was much much more flexible, so that if there was a crisis at least one of us would be able to be there for, for the children. So, you know, those things work for me and for us, but I wouldn't pretend to anybody that it was easy. And um, and it's not going to work for everyone. So I just think being really realistic about what it is that means you can flourish as a person and how you make the contributions to society and your family and all the other things that you might need to do, care for elderly parents and so forth. It's worth seeing all of these things as a whole and not just focus on one of them. It's easy to feel that you're not doing anything to the best of your ability, <laughs> isn't it? Um, really is. I think we've lost somebody. Have we, who have we lost? We lost Lucy and she disappeared. Hopefully she'll come back in. Um, anyone else want to pick up on that importance of uh, allies? I mean, I often, I often wonder about all of these women's groups, which are really important. And I'm part of one. I'm a founding member of the BBC Women Group, which now numbers you know, six, seven hundred women, all sort of uh, struggling to, to sort of fight for equal pay. How important is it to have men in the room as well? Often they're the decision makers and they're the, they're the people who we point sometimes in their own image. And we need we need don't, don't we need them on side, Maria? Um, absolutely. And you can see me nodding because I had an interesting experience a few months ago. I have um, I work with colleagues in Brazil and we have a project which is funded by British Council to support women's progression in STEM and support colleagues in Brazil, higher education institutions with um, making progress on this front, quality, diversity and inclusion. And I, um, I gave a presentation um, in a room which actually included quite a lot of men and men in senior positions, talking to them about issues that um, women face um, in uh, when they're progressing in their career in very male-dominated areas. And afterwards, I had colleagues that I've known for a while coming to me and saying, we had no idea that this is what you're going through. You know, I wish someone had told me earlier that this is how it feels from your side. And we had no idea. So unless we include them in the conversation um, and we tell them, we explain how it feels like. Some of these people have daughters. They would not want their children to be suffering. But we, we need to bring them into the conversation and create allies, not just with women, but with men as well, because it's only by working together that we are going to 
address all the issues that we are facing around equality, diversity and inclusion. So absolutely, we, they should not be ex excluded from the from the conversation. Thank you. I just want to check if we can check on um, Lucy so that we can get her back into the into the room. We often hear, don't we, about the importance of female representation in the boardroom, in executive positions. Um, why is it important, Sam, for women to be in those positions when it seems that structurally it's so hard for them to get there? Yeah, I mean, as someone who has not made it to the to the C-suite, yeah, I think you've got it, you've got to have that hope. You've got to have the the vision that you see women um, in those leadership roles. We've got we've we've got a, a female chair and we've got a female a, a acting CEO at the moment, and it is transformative because you see women women able to take that step further. And I think the the problem with women, if we're being really honest about it, is we all know incredibly capable women who will not apply for a job unless they feel they completely master it. I mean, I think the stats are a kind of, you know, men will apply for a job if they feel they can do 25% of the job description, whereas we all feel, you know, you have to be masters, you have to be able to do like 90% of it. So we just don't apply. So unless you start seeing women like Lynn and Ruth and and, and Maria, you're not, you're, you don't feel confident that you can even do it. And I think they if you get the right women in leadership, they then give you a leg up. Because to be honest with you, I've had some female bosses who didn't give women a leg up, actually, and actually made it tougher. And I've had some fantastic male bosses who absolutely were content to let you shine. And I think the bottom line is we have to promote people who have an inclusive mindset, who don't care who it is that's doing the work for them, but they recognise talent and they will promote that talent. Former Secretary of State of the United States, Madeleine Albright, famous quote, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help women. Uh, Lynn, to what, what, how, does it, how does it make um, the decisions that you decide upon at Thurrock different by having so many women in your team? That's a, a really good question, Martina. I think what we try to do in Thurrock is what colleagues on here have said, which is about an inclusive and an organisation which supports and promotes opportunity for everyone. And, and saying everyone isn't really as clear as it can be, but we try to have an organisation that imagines work is part of what we do in the big cycle of life. It's not all that we do. And I recognise that to get the best out of people in the organisation. Fundamentally, what I do as chief exec is try to support my, I don't know, 2,300 people to be the best that they can be, regardless of where they are in the organisation, because every single person is really, really important. And recognising that one size doesn't fit all as well, which I think some, some people have said. So it's around um, creating an environment where people can inspire to do what they feel um, uh, would meet their, their needs. It's flexible enough so that the people we support are still getting the support in terms of us making a difference to lives of people in Thurrock, and that's what drives us. But ultimately, it doesn't always have to be in, in one mindset, one approach, one process, one um, way of doing things. It's We've got to recognise that everybody is different and everyone brings different skills into work. And to get the best out of people, you've got to have that mindset that allows that flex flexibility. And I think I've learned over the years that, you know, there's, there's there's no always right or wrong answer to this. We've got to find it how we go along in terms of um, working it out. And I think my biggest learning at the moment is post-COVID in the last two years, this new world we're in, none of us have worked out yet how we're going to support each other, how we're going to continue to do what we want, how we're going to create the new norm, how we're going to support those in our communities who've been most uh, uh, you know, unequally affected. So I think it's really important that there are there is a flexibility of mindset that says, actually, we need to try and embrace support for as many people in the organisation as we can do. And they pay you back tenfold don't they when you offer, offer them that sort of flexibility quite often well, I certainly see that at the BBC uh, welcome back Lucy I'm glad that we got got you back again I just want to bring in a, a comment from um, one of our audience members Billy Forbes 
who says, I think it's really important to empower women from different backgrounds to believe in themselves and their power. Mindset and well-being is truly important when developing the self-belief needed to not let barriers beat you, to not let your differences be challenges. In fact, they can be extremely positive, can't they, those differences? I believe it's important to make well-being and mindset training a priority for young people to mould their minds. Lucy, how early do we need to start with that? Because it's not just about where you see yourself in the workplace. It's also about when, how you know, as a woman, a girl, how you're meant to be treated, the kind of respect that you should expect, which must be very key in, in your work. Absolutely. So I'd, I mean, my career actually started in working in schools and that's where I um, kind of developed this understanding that these behaviours sometimes start really, really young. Um, I mean, I used to work in a couple of um, primary schools in quite vulnerable areas as well. Um, so I would sort of look at the behaviours around the girls, around the boys, the interaction between uh, the two of them. And that's kind of got what got me into the work that I do now, because actually this this does start really Really, really young. Um, what we know as well is when we look at something like domestic abuse, um, roughly uh, 25 percent, so one in four of children that experience it in the home will go on to perpetrate it. Another 25 percent, one in four, will go on to be a victim as well in, in that environment where that behaviour is kind of normalised, that actually that's that's what we do, that's how we speak to each other, that's how we communicate with each other. Um, so for me, I'm a passionate kind of believer of, of the power of school as well in terms of, of developing a real understanding in the curriculum quite early around um, well-being, mental health, how we feel things that make us uncomfortable. And sometimes children struggle to verbalise people People perhaps think children are not old enough to understand some of these behaviours. But what it is more likely to be is they're not quite old enough to verbalise them, but they certainly feel them. They certainly feel that something's not quite right. They certainly feel uncomfortable. They perhaps don't necessarily connect uh, with the feeling they've got that that's maybe associated with something that they're experiencing at home or in their community. Uh, but for me, it's really, really fundamental because, as we know, once we reach adulthood, if we look at those kind of stats we know 50 percent roughly of children growing up with domestic abuse that pathway follows into adulthood so we want to be able to reach them at a much much earlier point thank you I, I thought that that might be your your answer doing it is a whole different Absolutely. challenge isn't it you know because schools in particular have got so many ex expectations made of them today I'm just conscious of the time and that uh, Maria will need to leave us fairly shortly so I just wanted to um, ask if you need to slip away at some point in the next few minutes Maria don't worry about that we, we understand um, but how can women and girls be more um, encouraged into STEM, Maria, would you say? We've been talking just in the last couple of minutes about how important it is to get in early, mm. uh, make it normal, make it possible. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I I always felt that you know the sciences were a boy's subject, even though I was mm. I quite enjoyed them. And I did have a lot of friends, female friends, who, who did do A-levels like um, Lynn and, and Ruth chose. Uh, thank you, Martin. This is a this is an excellent question, and it, it's not that easy to address. As I said earlier, we really need to start as as early as we can, really, in in, in schools, and reinforce messages about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, these kind of subjects being. Uh, actually subjects that everyone can tackle irrespective of gender, religion or, or race or, or, or anything else. Um, we need to bring in role models, but especially for girls, what we need to do is demonstrate that you can have really creative uh, really creative careers out of these prof uh, out of these disciplines and the some of the stereotypes that we have around for instance computer scientists walking around wearing sandals and white socks and being male or geeks being um, locked in their rooms playing games all day some of these we really need to break down because uh, otherwise we're not going to make a difference so demonstrating the range of careers professions that you can go in what you can really do with science and um, and all of these uh, topics, um, and then inspiring young women and and, and children in, in general, because we need a lot 
as a, as a country, we need to reinforce our engineering, science and technology sectors to, uh, to become more productive and to see innovation coming through. These are key areas. So it's across the board that we need to bring people in, but we have more difficulty bringing in the women and, and, and other uh, communities. Sandals and socks are very fashionable in some quarters, Maria. Um, I, I just wanted just quickly to, to finish uh, on that subject with you. How important is it with how science and technology are taught? Because, for example, when I was doing calculus in maths, I couldn't really understand why I needed to do it. It was terribly ab abstract until mm. the teacher explained to me that it was useful in engineering. And then I had I couldn't change gear very smoothly in a car until I understood how the clutch and the gearing worked. So I needed to understand. I need to be able to visualize it. I needed to understand why I was learning this stuff. How important is that in, in the way things are taught? Um, I think it's really important. It's how uh, sometimes we're being taught things and you are touching on a subject that um, I'm really passionate about, education, and how it is that we teach, not just young people, but how we teach in, in general, because we can um, switch on and off people um, from subjects, depending on how we teach things, we need to be able to demonstrate how uh, what we teach children, as you, as you rightly said, actually links to... Um, different types of applications. So you can see that actually learning about maths uh, can lead you to go into computer science that can then give you uh, the opportunity to work in the area of games and create uh, something something truly amazing. So making these connections and uh, linking them to real world applications and demonstrating the really exciting things that you can do is absolutely important because otherwise it just remains a very dry subject and we need to move away from that. But um, learners learn in different ways. And as, um, as an educator myself, I need to adapt the way I'm teaching things and how I bring my students into the subject matter. I think that's certainly changed over time, hasn't it? The recognition that people learn in different ways and need to be taught in, in different ways. Just a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions you'd like to send in, do post them in the chat function. Uh, Ruth, you've got your hand up, please. Uh, leap in. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in on that, actually, because I, I just completely agree. It's one of my big learnings in life, I suppose, largely as a, as a parent, that children are so diff different. They learn in completely different ways. And I think the school curriculum has completely underestimated uh, that fact, actually. And if I'd like to see two, two things change, it would be one, a much greater cross-curricular focus on bringing different aspects of the curriculum together to problem solve, so that people see why they're learning different things and the outcomes uh, that can go with that. And the other is an emphasis on the soft skills and presentation skills. And for this, I think it's particularly important uh, for women who don't necessarily, um, or girls, who uh, don't necessarily have those expectations when, when they're growing up, that they're going to stand in front of people and present and, you know, um, hold others to account and challenge and debate and so forth. Um, but also on other disadvantaged groups in society who don't necessarily make it. So, so for five years, I was um, privileged chancellor at St. Mary's University. And we started changing the entire assessment system because we realised that many of the people who came in to St. Mary's um, just, you know, lacked what we now call social capital. But it's really, the, the, you know, all of those skills that, that employers expect in the future. And if they're going to thrive, they're going to need to be able to thrive in the workplace. And they're not actually going to be asked about their calculus unless they're an engineer. An engineer. They're, they're going to be asked to, you know, look at something, research it, talk about it in the team, present to others and persuade. And, and uh, we just need to see a much greater emphasis on those sorts of things. Lynn? Again, totally agree on, on, on all that uh, has been said there. And I think it's really important about that, that learning style. Because I remember when I was in school, I didn't realise until I was in my 20s that I learned by doing things. So in terms of being lectured at, I don't know how many of you sat in lecture rooms as a child or as you know, a teenager or into further education. It just didn't do it for me. And I couldn't work out why it didn't. So it's a really, really important point in that. 
And then when when you get into, uh, you know, working, how many of us actually look on somebody's CV and look at the, the actual qualifications they've got and in what subjects? We look at what the individual has in terms of that social skill, their ability to work in teams, their, you know, as you said, Ruth, the ability to problem solve. Can they fit into the team? Will they add value to what they're doing? Do they understand what we're trying to do as an organisation in changing people's lives? So it's a completely different different, different mindset it that I think is is needed through through all of that and actually that's okay to have those conversations but if they don't happen in schools and the the the, the academy structure now is is even more challenging for how we as local authorities get in there where do those conversations happen and how do we support young people in being able to have that insight into their own abilities early enough to know that actually any of this stuff is is for us you know and I, I think about what I'm doing now did I know when I was doing my A-levels I was going to become a, you know, a local authority officer? Not at all. wouldn't have had a clue about that. But it was the skill set that I had in terms of analysis and thinking and you know, thinking outside the box. That are the things that we need in every single business that we, we run. And um, there is something about how do we go back? And, and the, the theme of this, isn't it, is about Thurrock Enterprise uh, Week and the number of jobs that are coming in our borough and more broadly – how are we going to support these young people now in five or 10 years? So we all need to be thinking, every single one of us on here, about how we, we start to create that, that pathway for people and young, young women and boys to know that this is all for them. It's not just something that, that happens and we're the lucky few. Um, it is for everyone. We're not special. I, th I don't feel I'm special or different from anyone else. But I had a few opportunities along the way inspired by my parents that others might not have. So there's something in there for me about our role in doing all of that, too. Sam, how, what sort of pathways are you trying to create in your sector? I think it's really interesting because a lot of my work ends up being involved in, although I'm not strictly in construction myself, I'm often talking about construction. I think some of the things that we've done are really simple. They're like literally getting the senior female women out of, of our business and into school science weeks, you know, be in the front of the video that we do for South End. You know, we're putting the women out there. Now, sometimes people are asking us, but actually, consciously we're making a decision i think to, as an organization to to promote those women give them that that um platform so that people can see that and i think that's making a, a really big difference and i think it's about the mentoring it is literally about putting your cash as an organization into the groups that need it whether it's you know getting experts to mentor you know our swan nation group people volunteer themselves to get training from an expert you know encouraging more senior people to ask for the right you know, I complained at work that I felt like I needed to someone to help me get to the next level. And someone was, a, first of all, they were a bit shocked. B, they said, well, you're, you know, go and sort it out for yourself. And I did go and ask some really great women to be a mentor. And so we now say to people, who is it you're asking to mentor you? So it's kind of making people think in a different way, I think, about how they can help themselves, but also giving them uh, visibility of, of people achieving. Lucy. Yeah, when I sort of started um, with the work that I did, so I came out of the domestic abuse sector and I started working then sort of with corporate organisations and, and sort of big employers. And um, I just kind of wanted everyone to care. And then it kind of, I wanted people to understand domestic abuse. I wanted people to understand it and how it was impacting on their staff. But what I would find very quickly coming from kind of that world, that third sector into sort of the corporate world, was there's so many different demands on employers, aren't there nowadays? So many different demands. And then we've moved into sort of through a pandemic, we're coming out the other side of a pandemic. And what we were constantly sort of finding, what was really we were struggling with in terms of what we did is we kind of lost that connection, that rapport with people. And we have this saying and it's with my team about putting the human back into human resources because we've kind of gone a little bit the other way, haven't we? And I think it's probably been fueled by the pandemic, hasn't it? We've lost that sort of connection with people. But we find to get the best out of people, it is all about communication. It's about rapport, isn't it? It's about whatever initiative that, that's happening. It is about that connection, that rapport, and that hope that you give somebody, um, ultimately. So really echoing what Sam said around, you know, the importance of people like mentors as well that can support somebody, have that positive communication with them is so, so important, I think. Yeah, for me, um, human resources became less human 
than they were when they were personnel officers. There seemed to be a very big change in the sort of, um, they seemed to become more of management than they had been sort of an impartial um, third party between the staff and, and those you, who were employing you. Um, I just People want to often refer to a policy, don't they? You know, to know how to act or how to behave, yeah. whereas it actually comes right back down to just human respect, isn't it, and communication. We don't yeah. necessarily need to open a policy every time we need to have a conversation with somebody. And I well, would feel I, very I nervous like to be dealt with that. this way myself, yeah. Uh, before you go, Maria, we've got one um, question from Rebecca Lee saying, can the panel share one top tip for a girl in school today? It's a deliberately open question. Help yourselves. Yeah. Um, what I would say is computational thinking when you are thinking ahead of what you would like to do um, in terms of a career. Do not uh, close any doors. Just learn whatever skills you can, but computational thinking and the ability to do problem solving will be absolutely vital going forward to support innovation and, and, and growth. And we we are seeing um, girls coming through, but we want a lot more. Ruth, what would your one top tip be for a girl in school? Well, I'll give one that um, I think I have benefited from, but it took me a long, long time to learn. So I'm a natural introvert. And uh, I think a lot of women are not very good at putting themselves forward. Uh, so the one tip I would give uh, to young people, um, and particularly girls, um, who are thinking about you know, what their next steps and so forth, is don't be afraid to put your hand up and ask questions at every stage. If you don't understand something, if you're curious about something, if you want to know what if, at every stage, you know, make sure you're the one asking the teacher or you're the one asking the presenter. Um, so I made a sort of uh, commitment to myself when I, I went uh, after I left school and I was, uh, I don't sound like an introvert, I know, but when I was working for The Guardian, um, I went to a number of seminars and I was uh, invited to and I sat there and I didn't say a word. And I thought to myself, um, actually, all the people sitting around the table are asking questions that I could have asked uh, I made a commitment to myself then. At the next one I go to, I'm going to be the first person to ask a question so, so no one else can steal my thunder. And uh, and I did. And I sort of got used to it eventually. And I got used to sort of, you know, making sure I contributed and not just left it to other people to contribute. And that's something I've carried with me. And so that's my top tip um, at the moment. Lynn, what would yours be? It's similar to, to Ruth in one respect, which is about putting your hand up, but putting your hand up to take on responsibility for something, because every time you do that, you learn something, and it's a, a really good um, opportunity. But also, um, what I personally learned is, I mean, up until my early 20s, I wouldn't even answer the phone at home when I was at my mum and dad's, because, my God, it might be somebody I didn't know, and how would I have that conversation? And I know some people would really find that difficult because now I can't stop talking ever um, but it's also that thing about if you're nervous nobody knows you're nervous so be confident because that's what will come across in um, in, in how you um, present. There are opportunities to present in all sorts of environments aren't there you don't have to be invited to present at a conference it can just be in a staff meeting you're, you're making a contribution in some way. And I try to sort of encourage people, to, to, women to do that. A friend of mine wrote, wrote a book recently during lockdown called She Said about getting millennial women to speak up. And she wanted me to talk about, you know, presenting at events. And I said, well, actually, some of the best ways that you can make an impact are in much smaller settings than that. And so she wrote a whole new chapter all about that. Um, and that, you know, just make sure that you say one thing and say it well, you don't have to be contributing all the time, but you just need to make yourself heard. Sam? I would say that the earlier you recognise that our inner voice is our own worst enemy and that we are our harshest critic, the better. Because actually, if you can get a handle on that when you're in school and understand that your voice will say, you can't do that, you, you know, your life would change anyway because you'd think actually do you know what I'm going to give it a go and and as Lynn says no one will know how nervous you are and actually what does it matter if you fail and I think there's a, a move in life isn't there to thinking about how 
our failures often bring us success. And I don't know, I love there's a podcast, you know, how to fail, you know, doing it well, which I find incredible because you get the most successful people who will tell you that their life, as Linda said earlier, you know, not everyone is special. Often people get to a really special place in life by a load of accidents and a load of failure, which ends puts them in the right place. So I think get hold of that voice and understand that failure is just a way of learning. I wish that that's the thing I wish I'd learned earlier is that it's it's actually quite useful to fail sometimes. I remember the one question I got wrong on a diving scuba diving exam is the one that will actually save my life. I can't remember all of the questions that I got right, but I can remember the one I got wrong because it was all to do with um, atmospheres of pressure and you know basically not killing myself. And so getting it wrong was a, a very good thing to do. Lucy I've got four daughters, so they're all sort of, uh, my youngest daughter is 21 now, so I'm sort of used to that kind of teenage angst as well when they go out and they're worried about what people think, aren't they? Um, but I always have said to my girls, and I would consider them all fairly confident now, just get out there, hold your head up and boss it. And if you make a mistake, just smile, because somebody will smile back at you and it will just ease that tension. Don't be afraid if you do get it wrong. But I always think if you can if you can smile, even if you do make a mistake, somebody will smile back at you and it just eases that whole tension. And then they say to me, oh, but you always go around smiling at everyone. And I go, yeah. <laughs> I think it really does well, work, doesn't it? And I went, yeah. Don't let, all, you know, people don't know that you're nervous. There's also proof, isn't there, that by smiling, you can actually make your brain feel quite happy. And it will, it, you can kind of kid yourself in a way. I mean, one of the things that um, I think that I really feel like I have to address is that when we were all growing up, I th we weren't subject to the scrutiny of social media, were we? Um how helpful, Maria, is social media and how much of a hindrance is it, do you think, these days? Because you, you feel like you need to be part of it, but it's a scary place to be, especially mm. for, for girls and women. Um, yes, indeed. Um, and since we're talking about education, I think one of the important lessons that we need to teach uh, the young people and, and children is their healthy habits around social media and how to uh, manage social media and their exposure to social media. Um, you're absolutely right. I didn't have that when I was a child. And I can sometimes I dread how uh, teenagers in particular are made to feel by what they're being told in social media. But we need to develop resilience within children um, and we need to teach them strategies to manage how it is that they are engaging with social media and the impact that this has on them, and but also the impact that their own behavior on social media has on others. Because again, it's not entirely clear to me that we all understand the kind of impact that we're having by the things that we say. And unfortunately, social media, a screen in general, sort of uh, detaches you from a reality to some extent. Um, and it acts like an enabler and you can feel like you are invisible and you can say whatever you want. Whereas what we need to teach everyone, but starting from a really young age, is that you we, 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 need, we, we need to respect each other. And respects, respect is not just on a physical setting, but it's also through social media and in every um, set of circumstances that, that we're facing because unless you've got respect for whoever it is that you are you're working with you are addressing your teacher your parents anyone you cannot build healthy relationships that must be have a real resonance with the work you do lucy yeah it does and i you know particularly having sort of daughter, i've got four daughters and a son um and i i kind of used to be you know as they were growing up sort of really concerned about the influence of of, of social media but I kind of have moved over to actually seeing the benefits of it as well, particularly as we've moved through the, the pandemic, pandemic, because social media has given them connection to their peers. When they couldn't see their peers, they couldn't have that connection. Social media was was everything for these for these children, you know, teenagers as, as they were growing up. Um, but obviously, there it's always about that careful balance between the two. So in terms of um, 
uh, sort of some, you know, as they're growing up, making sure we've got that connection and that communication in the real world as well as as well as online. Um, but what uh, was really concerning for us, obviously during the pandemic, uh, in the field that I work in um, around social media, was the kind of amount of stuff we leak on it. The amount of stuff we leak on social media um, through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through um, Instagram, we give so much information and we do a lot of um, sort of work with um, organisations that work with young people. So in terms of gang crime and grooming and exploitation, and it's quite shocking I didn't even realise the amount of stuff and the lengths that people will go to uh, in order to find out information, you know, even looking at their picture and looking at what's in the background. If they say a church or a high street in the background, that's used then uh, potentially to sort of track down where they live, work out the things that they like, the things they don't like. So when they see somebody in their community that they think they've got this connection with, that's because they've virtually been stalking them online. So I think it is... You know, I don't go as far to sort of say, you know, social ma media is dreadful. I don't know what this sort of horrendous world we're living in, because I do feel it does have some benefits. But it is always around that careful balance. Um, and like Maria said, it's about keeping safe online, isn't it? Understanding that not everything you see on social media and online is genuine. It's not all real, uh, potentially. And I think that's really, really important to be teaching children from a really young age as well. Thank you. Um Maria's had to leave us and um, she says thank you for the invitation. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation. Um, Billy Forbes says that she agrees with you, Lucy, that there are many positives and negatives. It's important to teach people how to use it mindfully. Uh, I often advise my clients to treat it like a vision board, only follow accounts that uplift you. Oh, that's a good idea. And make you feel good. It's important to time limit on apps and, and inform people on how to stay safe. Sam? I'd love to hear what people like you and Ruth and Lynn feel about social media because personally as an observer watching women who step up and take a really official post in the you know they put themselves out there honestly when you, the, the, sometimes the abuse that they receive is it, it, heartbreaking but also how do you do you become resilient to that to keep on with your your your, your role I mean it, it must be so difficult Ruth, a lot of politicians, female politicians have a torrid time, don't they, on social media? I can't, I can't begin to imagine what it's like to be in public life in the front line now. There was, it's hard to believe there was no social media uh, when I was an MP. Uh, the worst we got was a flood of emails. And, you know, and it just takes some, something for someone to look up your email address and send you an email. So, you know, there, were, there weren't that many. And to be honest, I never really saw them anyway. And you might get the odd sketch writer writing about you in the, in the papers, um, which, you know, you just had to become resilient to. But to, to the, the social media abuse that people face now is completely horrendous. I mean, Diane Abbott was subject to extraordinary targeting um, from trolls. And, uh, you know, I, don't, I, just, I just don't know how people become resilient to that. It's a huge factor now, I would say, in whether people choose to go into public life or not. I, I hear what people say about the positives of social media, and I know there are positives of social media, um, but the downsides for me are so enormous uh, with young people uh, in general. And, um, you know, um, uh, um, you, you've got three daughters, um, Lucy, I think, but um, uh, four, four daughters, four daughters. I've, I've got three daughters. So, um, you know, you, you, every single young woman that I know knows which side of her face is the better side uh, for a picture to be taken or, you know, whether their nose is slightly wonky or, or not. And it has created a whole generation which are completely obsessed by how they appear on social media. And um, I read somewhere quite recently, um, I think it was Jonathan Sachs, the late... Um, uh, chief rabbi, who, who wrote that um, uh, when the mirror was introduced in the 18th century, there was a decline in the use of the word we in the English language and a rise in the use of the word I in the English language. And I would imagine something similar and much more dramatic has happened since the rise of social media and the sort of, you know, hours that our young people spend taking photographs of themselves and admiring it, 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 Every single, you know, like may uh, or comment you receive may be a positive one. But even if it's a positive one, 
It's, you know, it's very, very self-absorbed. And then this whole thing about knowing what your friends are doing and seeing them, you know, on maps and about enjoying themselves. And, you know, in the past, we wouldn't have known if we'd been left out of an invitation. Um, that, in my view, is undermining people's resilience. And somehow, and I have no idea how, uh, society is going to have to get a handle on this. Lynn, how do you navigate it? Are you... Are you present on social media or do you, you do limit it um i am not on social media in terms of work uh, for all the reasons that colleagues have, have um described and when i first came to thurk i was asked if i wanted a twitter feed to be as chief executive of thurk council and look i take my responsibilities for what we do absolutely seriously but i knew of other chief execs who were absolutely lambasted on it, and it had such a, a, a negative impact on their, their their mental well-being. I decided not to. W what I would say, in my experience in Thurrock, and and I know there's colleagues of mine who are who are listening to the court at the moment. Um, social media has attacked um, the council in all sorts of ways, and and fully support freedom of press. Absolutely, let me say that to start with. But to attack individuals, including myself. To be described in local press outlets as having killed children and babies through the actions of our local authority, to name and shame officers inappropriately and attack them is not what I think the world is that we're in and should be about. And if there's one thing that we we drive in Thurrock, we work really hard on, it's our hashtag be kind initiative and about you know, my mum used to have lots of sayings. She's a York, she was a Yorkshire woman, so she is. She was, she's been past now nearly six years. And, and I find myself, as I'm getting older, repeating all of these things. And I understand now why she used to say them. And two things spring to mind when I think about social media. And the first is, she used to say, if you can't say something to somebody's face, don't say it at all. And I think that's absolutely... Social media allows these keyboard warriors to hide behind that and not allow you to have a debate and a conversation that says, well, look, why do you think that? Well, actually, that's not who I am. But also, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And you can have opinions, but you don't need to share them. And I think in the world we're in, in local government, and more broadly, politics is the point that was made as well, you have to ask yourself, is this really, sometimes I ask myself, is this really what my team signed up for and how do I protect them? How, I, how I'm resilient is that over time, your skin gets toughened as a hide, you have to do. Um, I don't read it is number one. So I don't go on and look at all that stuff. I just refuse to read it. I have my own Facebook pages, but they're locked down completely so that nobody can access them. And interestingly, when we had some um, attacks by a, a certain very right white can't say it, right wing group a number of years ago, the advice from police was about going on and checking all your own social media and doing all that. And I sat there thinking I signed up to make a difference to people's lives and improve their outcomes. Yet I feel under personal attack and worried about the safety of my family. And I think that's the world we're in at the moment. So I don't think there's any easy answers. But I think being able to talk about it and say this is not acceptable in any stretch of, of, of form. And actually, if you don't have the, the ability to go and have a decent conversation with somebody, and people have difference of opinions, that's absolutely fine. But to be able to do that in a way which allows an appropriate response, then there's, there's something wrong in the society that we're in at the moment. And I think for me... It's the one thing that we really need to work hard on our young people to support them in a world which is toxic in many ways and trying to protect them and enable them to grow and to be independent and to reach out to their friends. It's a scary world out there for them. And I think it's a huge responsibility we have as local government, politicians, the press to try and to try and stop that negativity in a way which doesn't um, stifle good uh, debate and conversation. My daughter's 17, nearly 18. She's had social media for years now, of course, and um, she recognises the need to step away sometimes when it becomes corrosive. And I'm really pleased that from now, every now and again, she deletes the apps and just takes a break. Um, let's let's try and end on a very positive sort of note, shall we? Um, Ruth, how is Thames Freeport sort of helping the sort of levelling up idea in, in Thurrock and, and what sort of opportunities will there be for women in, in that process? 
Lots, I hope. And um, the whole idea of the Freeport is that it tracks lots of inward investment into the Freeport uh, areas that may not have been there, and that should benefit Thurrock and Havering and Barking and Dagenham boroughs, and that all the business rates that they would have brought with them can then be used by Thurrock Council uh, to invest in regeneration projects. So uh, the question really is how do we use regeneration to make sure that that's inclusive and sustainable regeneration and that everybody has opportunities and not just the people who would have got on anyway. And so that's the next phase of the project, really. First, the first part of the project has been setting up the free port, but, but Lynn will have £300 million to spend on regeneration uh, as, a result of, as a result of the free port, assuming that everything works well and that we're given the, the all clear, which we hope to, to happen later, later this month or fairly soon. Um, and then uh, we have to use that to make sure that everybody, whether it's through the jobs that are created, we think there'll be 20, over 20,000 direct jobs created as a result of the Freeport, or the skills that we, um, that, that we invest in are there for everybody, uh, no matter who they are and what their background. Thank you. Sam, um, what are the sort of improvements that you're seeing when it comes to engaging women in the, the diverse sense, you know, women from all backgrounds, and making sure it's not just about diversity, it's also about inclusion, isn't it? It's not just about having people, you've appointed them, you then need to properly engage them and use all their skills, because they're two very different things. Mm, I, think, I think that's a really good point. And I think the, the way we're looking at it at SWAN it's about getting a voice and 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 bringing people together and it doesn't matter what group you fall in it's collectively bringing those voices together now that ripples out to the work that both Ruth and Lynn, and Lynn have talked about because we're involved in regeneration activity and, and that starts from, from day one where you make sure that a community has a voice and is able to shape you know how Lynn spends that you know 300 million pounds whatever it is that comes that comes from the Freeport and that they can get what they need out of it and it is inclusive so I think as an organization we're making sure our, our, our staff have a voice and and can influence and uh, you know the right people are able to 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 have their say but also you know making sure that we empower the communities to have say over their homes and their lives and you know what you what you put in a community space can make a massive difference if you put nothing for people to have you know events and to come together and be a community and and and, and nurture each other that then that stuff can't happen can it and so it's right from day one it, it's like co-design thing that yes. I mentioned when I yes. introduced you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not like not imposing things on people but getting them to be no. part of the formulation of it. And so the perfectly on Thames regeneration, you know, that that community have been involved since the project was conceived and they are literally co-designing, you know, they're working on the, the moment at the moment what's gonna happen in the market square. And you don't just go, oh, do you know what you need in that market square? You need a pop-up market selling, you know, organic bread. No, no, no. You have to work with the community and say, what is it that you want from there? What would be right for your community? And it, it isn't the answer will surprise you because it's it's their view, not not our views as regeneration agencies. Lucy, um, how can employers better support women? I mean, particularly around things like abuse or coerce, coercive control. What are the signs to look out for? And how should I'm asking you so many questions? Uh, how how should a, an employer go about broaching the subject? Because it's tremendously sensitive, isn't it? And a lot of people may not feel, women may not feel that they're able to admit that they're really struggling. Absolutely. So the first thing that I would say is very, very much about going back to kind of the same old record with me, isn't it, about rapport and communication, because in actual fact, any uh, body that's experiencing domestic abuse and going through what may be a horrific spiral uh, potentially in their home life uh, is going to really struggle to talk about it. So if we've got a work environment already that values people, that values connection, that values rapport and support. We're already a step ahead in terms of potentially somebody wanting to open up uh, to us. 
We always say uh, in terms of, of a workplace uh, or an employer to never, ever insinuate abuse. Uh, there are lots and lots of different signs uh, that you might see, uh, but sometimes they can be attributable to other things. So we don't necessarily want to insinuate uh, that somebody is experiencing abuse. So things like um, lateness, absence, but also things like what we call presenteeism, where somebody just doesn't seem to want to go home. They're still coming to work even when they're not well. Uh, very close connections with things like obsessive disorders, eating disorders for things. So to really equip yourself as an employer to know what some of these subtle signs might be. And we often or I often get asked, you know, I don't know. And I think, Maxine, you've just said it. I don't know what I would say to somebody. How do you even approach? You actually just start by asking if they're okay. It's that simple. We don't steam in kind of insinuating anything. You ask them, are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? If there is, I'm here. Um, do you want me to make you a cup of tea? Really very, very gently, uh, because if you have a supportive um, workplace, you value mental health, you value well-being, you've set all of that groundwork for somebody then to potentially open up. Um, so as I say, you're a much, much further um, step ahead. But we provide lots of different training. Uh, we support employers uh, in terms of developing uh, quite robust policies as well, how to respond um, if they are really concerned about somebody, but they're just not perhaps getting anywhere with getting them to try and open up. So we offer lots of different levels of support uh, to employers. And we always just say really at that, at its core, build your understanding, build your understanding and build your connection to your staff. Thank you. Lynn, when you're in receipt of public funds, there are extra responsibilities placed upon you when it comes to things like equality. Um, when you're investing money, to what extent do you carry out equality impact assessments to, to, to work out whether women are going to be advantaged or disadvantaged? It, it, it's core to everything that we do, Martine, and, and, and it goes beyond equality uh, impact assessments, which we do on everything that we do of a significant nature. So all our cabinet reports and decisions are, are based around um, EQIAs, but it's much more fundamental than that. It goes back to the point that Sam was talking about, about co-design, co-production with communities. And our approach in Thurrock is very much around the collaborative communities framework, not just in adult social care and health, but that has been where, where the approach has started. But across our whole organisation, being able to demonstrate and work with communities, all our very diverse communities in Thurrock, to um, provide bespoke services that meet their individual needs. And I think that's what's fundamentally different. And your point about public money is, is, is absolutely right. There's all the usual checks and challenges in place, but I think those of us who are public servants, many here are as well, um, it's about using every pound as effectively as we can to have the best outcome for people, in many cases, who are the most vulnerable in, in society. And there's something for me as a local authority about not working in isolation. So working with partners in the placemaking agenda, working through the free port, working with health, working with the voluntary sector, so that in a place like Thurrock, every single pound we spent is spent understanding the impact of it and getting the best out of it for every single person in the, the, the community. And that takes a lot of thinking and a lot, a lot of drive, but the outcomes are much, much better as a result. So I think we can establish that there's still a lot of work for us to do to make sure that we break we break the bias and that women get a fair crack at things. But lots and lots of initiatives uh, coming down the pipe uh, to try to engage women from all backgrounds in, in a variety of different ways across uh, the workplace and, and across society. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's event. On behalf of Thurrock Council, I would like to thank our panellists, Ruth Kelly, Lucy Whitaker, Samantha Waite, uh, Maria Fasley, who left us a little while ago, and Lynn Carpenter for sharing uh, their insights. Thank you so much for making it a conversation rather than uh, me just uh, grilling you all. It's it's much <laughs> more of an interesting watch, I think, for, for people. Um, and thank you very much to the team who put this event together uh, and supported us all in, in getting us here today. Um, it, it takes quite a lot of effort to get this off the ground, and, and it's been fascinating to, to talk to you all. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us and have a very happy International Women's Day.